Hi, I'm. Oh, sit down. Can you hear me? Good. I'm Jen Glazer, and I'm going to be talking about vulvar pain and pain during sex. Um, I am a registered nurse. On the floor, I took care of post. Oh, sorry, forgot to click. There we go. Um, on the floor, I took care of postpartum patients and their newborns. And now I'm a PhD student at the University of Illinois Chicago in the College of Nursing. There I research chronic pain in vulvodynia and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, vulvodynia's vulvar pain of unknown causes. And I kind of fell into this research. I w originally went to work with my advisor who studies vulvodynia, and she was trying to recruit for her study. And she was having a difficult time finding people because like EDS, vulvodynia is underdiagnosed. Um, and there isn't a lot of awareness about it. So I was like, well, you should look in the EDS population. A lot of the comorbid conditions overlap. And I've seen um, patients talking about vulvar pain. And she's like, well, you know, is there a higher incidence of vulvodynia in EDS? Like, what's the research? And I'm like, well, there is none, um, just like most things with EDS. So this kind of led to um, my PhD studies, where I'm now looking at vulvar pain and vulvodynia within EDS. Um, I'm funded by the EDS Society for this work, along with the National Institutes of Health and the Rockefeller University Heilbrunn Family for a Center of Research. I have no disclosures. Trigger warning, we will be talking about sex, and there's anatomical drawings of vaginas. This, so, so we're all on the same page. This is the vulva. It includes the clitoris, the labia minora, and the labia majora. From the labia, the outsides of the labia majora in that, makes up the vulva. So if you have pain, what should you do? First of all, seek help. Um, out of a survey of 1,200 people with vaginas that have EDS, half report, or sorry, 67% report, reported they had pain. Of that 67%, 41% did not tell their doctor. Of those, 33% were given responses outside of guidelines. And when I say responses outside of guidelines, they were told, drink a glass of wine, or you need to be more turned on, or pain is normal. So when I say pain during sex is not normal, what I mean is it's important to talk to a doctor about it. Things can be done. It doesn't have to be the status quo. So who should you talk to? Um, your gynecologist, your gynecologist, or a midwife. If your doctor is unsure you know, what's causing it or unsure about treatment, or maybe you're not comfortable speaking with them, um, ask for a referral out. Urogynecologists are usually very familiar with these types of conditions and can help you. Um, just like all EDS things, it's very important to advocate for your needs. Ask for those referrals, push, because especially with vulvodynia, uh, there's not a ton of research on it, so their doctors aren't always sure how to treat it, so you need to ask for that referral out and advocate for yourself. Come in. So now we're gonna talk about pain during sex. So pain during sex in anyone, and when I say pain, I mean pelvic pain. I know with EDS, you can have pain anywhere. So if you have shoulder pain during sex, it doesn't count. Um, pelvic pain during sex is called dyspareunia. And within this medical term, um, for people with vaginas, sex means vaginal penetration. Doesn't need to be a penis, but vaginal penetration, if you have pain with that, it's called dyspareunia. So in the general population, 20% of people with vaginas have dyspareunia. Within the EDS population, we think it's between 67 and 77%. As you can see, that is much higher. There aren't a lot of studies as to why, though, so that's what I'm kind of trying to look into. These are all the causes of dyspareunia. As you can see, there's a lot of them. I'm going to try and break them down into some groups, um, what kind of what kind of things you could do about them. Um, there's different ways you can categorize, categorize dyspareunia. You can break it down by location or when it started. If you break it down by location, there's deep versus superficial. Deep, just like it sounds, um, 
is within the pelvis, and superficial is the outside, so that vulva that we discussed, and then the one outer one-third of the vagina. You can also break it down on when it started. So did you have pain from the first time you had sex and on, or did it start with subsequent sexual intercourse, not right after the first time you had sex, but sexual intercourse after <laughs> the first time? Most, um, most of the time we break it down by location, because that kind of helps us figure out what's causing it. So first we'll talk about causes of deep dyspareunia. There's pathological group up there in the top and then more of like structural issues there on the bottom. Pathological issues can include things like endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, ovarian cysts. So if you look at that picture on the right, you can see all those organs and everything around the vaginal canal. So if you think about it, if there's something going in there and there's uh, issues that are inflamed or unhappy and they're being moved around or jostled or poked, it's going to be tender. Um, also trauma. So if you've had surgeries, C-sections, when those scars heal, the tissues can get stuck together. And if things are moving around, there's friction and that can hurt. Also um, structural issues. So pelvic, pelvic organ prolapse, which occurs within EDS younger more often, pelvic floor dysfunction, which also happens a lot due to pelvic instability and weakness and hemorrhoids, all of these things we see frequently. Superficial causes of dyspareunia include um, skin issues and then some more of the physical, such as lacerations. So skin issues are dryness due to menopause, trauma from um, childbirth or skin tears. We're starting to see more literature about the micro skin tears occurring within EDS. Haven't seen many studies on it, but it's starting to show up that, oh, this is being reported. Um, and then lichen sclerosis and li lichen planus, like, sorry, lichen sclerosis and lichen planus. I'm not gonna go too much into those. Those are skin disorders where if you have that, your doctor will see that you have that and you'll get treated for that. Um, but the other stuff is a little bit more trying to figure out what's going on. So also medical treatment can cause the superficial dyspareunia. If you're on hormonal birth control, it can dry things up, make the skin um, a little bit more friable, which can cause to tear a little bit with the friction. Same with chemotherapy or radiation. Um, vulvodynia also causes superficial dyspareunia and same with pelvic floor dysfunction. I'm gonna go a little bit more into those. So pelvic floor dysfunction, I'm, heard, I'm sure you guys have been hearing a lot about this. It's the inability of pelvic floor muscles to contract and relax the way they're supposed to, um, and they kind of have that high resting tone. So this occurs a lot with pelvic instability. If you think about it, the pel pelvis is moving around too much, muscles can like clamp down to try and hold it together, but they're also not relaxing. So if you have that, say, high resting tone, you'd think, oh, they're probably strong muscles but they're just trying to like tighten and hold on. They're not relaxing and working together in the way that they should be. Um, and if you have pain, then you're gonna be stressed and tighten up even more. So it's gonna create this cyclical cycle of tightening pain, tightening pain. This can be treated with physical therapy or acupuncture. And during um, physical therapy, you can have manual release, exercise, biofeedback, TENS, um, and you can also use dilators. So now we're gonna talk about vulvar pain. Um, as we, I showed you before, the image of the vulva. So most people that have vulvar pain also have dyspareunia, as you can imagine, because it's the entrance to the vagina. And you usually have to touch the vulva to go into the vagina. So you can have vulvar pain without sexual intercourse. So if like your under, underwear is touching it, um, first masturbation, um, or just spontaneously. So we're gonna talk about vulvar pain, which is outside of dyspareunia. But since if you have vulvar pain, you probably have dyspareunia, the conditions that kind of overlap in their causes. So causes of vulvar pain, you have the pathologic, which is cancer or Paget's disease, neurological, so nerve damage, you could have nerve damage from surgeries, from childbirth, um, herpes, structural issues such as pelvic floor dysfunction, 
labral tears we're finding might be related because they can cause that pelvic instability. Um, when I say labrum, it's cartilage inside the hip that acts as like a suction cup kind of to help stabilize the hip. So if you have a tear in that, just like if you have a tear in the edge of a suction cup, it doesn't stabilize as well anymore. So again, then the muscles in your pelvis are kind of locking down and that can cause some issues. Skin issues just like before, um, cuts from childbirth, micro cuts, and then there's also vulvitis or vaginitis, the infections or irritations related to detergents. And I'm starting to see some more readings about vulvar edema, edema occurring spontaneous in people with HEDS. Um, not just mainly descriptions of it yet, so I'm waiting for some more research coming out on that. So vulvodynia. Vulvodynia is vulvar pain of unknown causes with dyspareunia. So in order to be diagnosed with vulvodynia, all those other reasons that I just described have to be ruled out. Um, and it's superficial pain. It's burning, itching, sharp pain. There's two different types, um, provoked, which can be called provoked vulvodynia or provoked vestibular dynia. Um, Research is kind of growing within this area, and as we go along, the nomenclature changes, just like with EDS. You have the, you know, we had um, the changes in the hypermobility spectrum disorder and whatnot, so it's the same kind of evolution. So provoked is when you have pain that is elicited by a contact. So as I mentioned before, that can be caused by underwear, oops, sorry, um, underwear touch, sitting, or you can have generalized, which just occurs spontaneously, and that pain can continue down along the thighs or the groin. So we think there's an overlap between vulvodynia and EDS. We don't know what causes vulvodynia, um, so we're not really sure about what that cause is, but also studying it and EDS might help unlock some of the secrets behind it. So some of the comor comorbid conditions that overlap include IBS, interstitial cystitis, mast cell activation, migraines, TMJ, fibromyalgia. I'm sure you guys have all seen these and read the, about these in EDS many times. Um, there's factors that we think are associated with the cause of vulvodynia, including pelvic floor dysfunction, central nervous system sensitization, which is when your central nervous system can kind of be primed, like if with chronic pain, you react, um, your body reacts to things that wouldn't normally be um, activated by otherwise, and mast cell disorders. So in the general population, vulvodynia occurs at a rate of 8%, we believe. As I said, it's under-diagnosed um, because, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, because of awareness and people not wanting to talk about the condition or the symptoms. But within the EDS population, sorry, I just conducted a survey and using four questions that are found to be reliable and valid for predicting vulvodynia, of about 1,200 females, half screened positive for vulvodynia. So that's a six-fold increase. Um, so that's, for my PhD study, I'm now looking at characterizing all this pain to see if we can get some idea as to why is that rate so much higher. Um, within dyspareunia and vulvodynia, we think there's psychological factors involved. We still don't know why, but we think sexual abuse, um, adverse childhood events, post-traumatic stress, stress, anxiety, and depression can all um, play a factor. The stress, anxiety, and depression we think might play a role in that when we are stressed or depressed, we tighten up our muscles, and that can play into the pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, so it's, it's pretty common to do cognitive behavioral therapy for these conditions as well. And that can trigger some people to be like, okay, maybe the doctor thinks it's all in my head. But this should be paired with other types of treatment. But it has been shown to help. So let's talk about treatment now. How can we help? So deep dyspareunia, I'm going to break it down by cause because you're going to tackle these in different ways. So um, with pathological issues, you're going to do antibiotics for things like pelvic inflammatory disease, surgery for endometriosis, um, and chemo and radiation if there's cancer. For structural, you have physical therapy or acupuncture for pelvic floor dysfunction and surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. For superficial um, pathologic issues, you do antibiotics for vaginitis if it's an infection, 
chemo and radiation for cancer, corticosteroids for lichen planus, which is a skin disorder. As I mentioned, cognitive behavioral therapy or hypnosis for psychological or trauma. Um, and if it's induced by medications such as hormonal birth control, if you're able to switch out maybe to a copper IUD that's non-hormonal, or use items like condoms um, for contraception. You can also add, add in more lubrication. Um, if it's related to chemo, depending on the type of cancer, they may be okay with doing um, estrogen cream. They also do estrogen cream for dryness with menopause. So vulvodynia treatment, um, like I mentioned before, we still don't know the cause, and that makes it difficult to find an effective treatment. There is still no consistent effective treatment that we've identified. Um, there are, we, we have some leads, though. We, physical therapy with or with other treatment, we find that a multimodal approach often works best because we think those are, there's those different associated factors. Acupuncture, um, TENS units, vaginal dilators, and medication. Medication includes overnight lidocaine to the vulva with or without um, disipramine, which is like an anti-epileptic, or yeah. Uh, intravaginal diazepam with TENS that can help the muscles relax for the uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, the hypertonicity part. Botulin toxin type A injection, so that injects into knots within the vaginal canal in the muscles, um, which helps again with the pelvic floor dysfunction, or anoxaparasodium subcutaneous in injections in the abdomen. And what that means is it's um, a blood thinner, and they're just small injections in the abdomen. Um, we think it might be related to some of the nerve endings that proliferate then with vulvodynia. So that's kind of an interesting finding that they found to be helpful with treating vulvodynia. So the takeaway is that vulvar pain and pain during sex appears to be more common within EDS. You need to find a doctor that you will trust and listen to you. Um, like I said, if, if they're not hearing your concerns or they're dismissing them, ask for a referral out, switch the doctor if you don't like them, because there is help. Dyspareunia is not normal and can be treated. And, that, and by not normal, I mean that it's not the status quo. You, there's things you can do. And more research is needed, just like everything with EDS. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, the QR code has all the references. I also put additional readings on there if you're interested in exploring. I'm also opening up my survey for my PhD project as of today, which is I'm characterizing generalized and vulvar pain in EDS. So if you have vulvar pain, you can participate. If you don't, you can participate. It's um, that little code on there, so thank you.